Welcome to Spread the Light, where we use the power of our own stories of living with mental illness to dispel stigma and stereotypes, and instead, spread hope and light. I'm your host, Dr. Devika Bhushan. I'm a pediatrician, a public health practitioner, an immigrant to the U.S. from India, a parent, and also somebody with lived experience with bipolar disorder. Today, we're all very lucky to be welcoming to the show Dr. Jake Goodman, who is a friend, a psychiatry resident physician, and a global mental health activist with more than 2.1 million followers on social media. He is a two-time TEDx speaker, member of the University of Georgia Alumni Association's 40 Under 40 list, and a participant in the Healthcare Leaders and Social Media Roundtable series for the White House. Dr. Jake uses his platform to fight stigma and discrimination and empower those experiencing mental health challenges to seek help. His advocacy has been featured in Good Morning America, Yahoo News, and this summer he was just named one of 60 top influencers by Men's Health. I first came across Dr. Jake's work when in December of 2021, he posted this photo on social media with the words, my name is Dr. Jake. I'm a physician who treats mental illness and I take medication for my mental health. And also in that post, he mentioned that as a doctor training to be a psychiatrist, most in his field would advise him not to post something like this. Some would view it, he said, as a risk for my career but I didn't join this field to continue the status quo. With that, welcome to the show, Jake, and it's a thrill truly to have you here. Thank you, David. Honored to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. So tell us a little bit about how your mental health journey began. Sure. I mean, I had a typical millennial kid's introduction to mental health, which was pretty much nothing in elementary school, middle school, just kind of like very poor understanding of what mental health is and how many people are affected with mental health conditions. So when I started to experience anxiety in college, I didn't know what was going on with me. It's one of those like typical scenarios that you see in like medical board exam questions where it's like person goes to doctor to see why they are having palpitations and uh, difficulty sleeping and all the tests are run and they're all negative. You know, what's the diagnosis? And I remember the doctor saying to me in um, college, I think what you're experiencing is anxiety. And I was in complete denial. There's absolutely no way I'm experiencing anxiety. I'm not somebody that struggles with mental health. That's not me. I remember thinking like, that can't be me. I kind of, over the next decade, realized eh, he was probably right because I did experience bouts of anxiety throughout college and medical school, but I never really sought treatment for my mental health until I was in residency where I'm at today. Now I'm a, I'm a third year resident doctor. During my first year of residency, you know, my, my intern year, I was struggling at the time really with depression, although I didn't realize I was depressed at the time. It took a gentle nudge from a colleague and a friend to be like, hey, uh, you're depressed. You know, like I I was somebody that treated depression every single day, but it was hard to even recognize it myself. I sought help at that time. And that process of seeking help was totally life changing. And today I'm in a really amazing place with my mental health. And I'm so grateful that I did finally seek help. That's really striking how with both your earlier experiences with anxiety as a college student and then later with depression in medical training, it was hard to recognize what was going on for yourself and in yourself. And if you could reflect a little bit on how that happened and what it took for you to come to terms with the experiences that you were having as being mental health conditions. Sometimes it requires somebody else to really say something, you know, I thought I was burned out, right? I was feeling burnout. That's like a common thing we hear in medicine. Like, I'm just really burned out right now. And burnout can be a a cover for 
depression, anxiety, so many different things. I mean, burnout is totally real. I'm not discounting burnout in the slightest, but I think we overuse the term burnout and we underuse the term depression. And I think I, I was telling myself, you know, yeah, I'm not sleeping great and uh, my appetite's not the best. I'm feeling kind of low energy. Even though these are symptoms of depression, I'm I'm not depressed. I don't meet the full criteria, you know, however you want to justify it in yourself. What really started to wake me up a little bit is that I started experiencing anhedonia, which um, for the listeners uh, that may not be aware, anhedonia is essentially a fancy term for lack of joy or pleasure in things that you normally like doing. And real true anhedonia is you feel nothing, you know, like there's something missing playing soccer and feeling nothing. And that's when I was like, this might be a little bit more than burnout. I had a conversation with a friend over lunch one time um, around that time. And she said, I was telling her how I was feeling and telling how burned out I am. And she said, I, I think you might be depressed. And then it was just like, boom, fireworks in my head. Like all the synapses and neurons connected. Like, oh yeah, I am depressed. Then I moved into, you know, stages of what do I do about it? And uh, step one, I reached out to a therapist and that was amazing. I had seen a therapist once or twice in college uh, when I was struggling with some things, but I never actually went to therapy for more than a, one time. Therapy was amazing. Uh, and still I go to therapy still to this day. And then I reached out to a psychiatrist and ultimately uh, was, was started on antidepressant and the combination of, of medication and therapy did wonders for me. And that's amazing. What was your process like for wanting to go public and posting that really iconic photo that went viral? Yeah, I never realized it would go that viral, truly. Uh, my, <laughs> I, I mean, that thing... Uh, I'll walk you through the experience. So basically, you know, I was struggling. I reached out for help and I started to feel better. At this point, as I'm starting to feel better, keep in mind, I'd built a following of like, at that point, it was probably a million and a half, 1.2 to 1.5 million followers across all social media. People really followed me for my education videos about mental health, my videos destigmatizing mental health. But at that point, I had really not at all talked about my own mental health due to several things. Number one, stigma. And number two, fear of what people would think of me. And number three, throughout most of my journey on, on social media at that time, I was a medical student. And being a medical student, applying for residency, you feel like you're under a magnifying glass and a spotlight. And I was afraid of ever talking about my mental health. In fact, I had a a uh, disclaimer that I'd put at the end of every single post where something like, um, this post does not reflect my own mental health. However, I will always use my platform to fight for mental health, something like that. And a lot of the times it did reflect my mental health, but I was putting that disclaimer on there to, to protect myself at, at the time or what I, I thought I needed protection at that time um, as I'm interviewing for residency and stuff like that. Okay, fast forward. Yeah, so I'm, I'm feeling better. I'm in the process of feeling better, which is like the best feeling, like uh, going from depressed to like starting to crawl out of depression is like, I mentioned this in social media before, it's like a top 10 life experience. Just like putting on glasses and being like, oh, wow, I can absolutely see the world. It's no longer black and white. One way I describe it as well is like when I was playing soccer, because I, I, soccer is a huge part of my life. When I was playing soccer, when I was depressed, it was as if I had no peripheral vision. I could only see right in front of me. Truly, that's how it felt. I, I, I would people would come up beside me, kick the ball right away. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I, I was only seeing right here, right in front of me. And as I'm getting out of depression, all of a sudden, I'm seeing all around me. Truly, I'm seeing like I'm more aware of of, of my surroundings. It's like it was amazing, and I wanted to share that with people who follow me, who who follow me and listen to what I say and are invested in my educational videos where I talk about mental health and destigmatize mental health. And I basically had this conversation with myself, like, you know, obviously this is a, this could be a risky post. Uh, people may view me differently. This might change things, but I'm at the time I was probably the most followed resident doctor in the country. Maybe there were a few others that were more followed than I was. And I was like, 
how powerful would it be if I put a photo up of me with an antidepressant in my mouth and said that I take medication for my mental health, and by the way, I'm proud of it. How many people could that potentially save? People that may have been on the fence about ever seeking help in the first place. And I, I hit post. I, I mean, I had it in my drafts for about a month while I really was like in my head about it. And then one day I just kind of had this clarity and I was like, I'm going to do it. And I hit post and I went to sleep and I woke up in the morning and it was viral. That's an incredible journey. And the fact that it took that month of sort of thinking it through the what ifs, the pros and the cons. And then finally, this moment of this is this is happening today. I'm going to do this. It's this thing that's going to help so many other people. This is and it did. And it and I've received thousands of messages from people all over the world after that. After that, it was like a door opened and people flooded through from, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, you can imagine, because I posted that on Twitter too. Now, Twitter is a particularly savage place at times. So you can imagine there were some people that hated me for seeing that. How dare a... Uh, a doctor put a pill on his mouth and post about it. Pharma must be paying him. You know, I was getting like legitimate hate mail. But I, 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 I hate to even, you know, bring that up because reality is that was point, point five percent of it. 99.5% was very much like, thank you for doing this. My son, my daughter, my friend, my mom is also experiencing uh, mental health issues and this post makes them feel less alone and particularly in the medical community a lot of people reached out you know medical students and residents and attendings because in medicine is a huge stigma about doing what I did it helped a lot of people and it continues to help a lot of people so I have zero regrets about clicking post I love that and you know the kind of numbers that you shared uh, mirror my experience of coming out with bipolar disorder as well. It was, I would say, 98 to 99.5% positive, you know, floodgates open, people just um, sharing their own experiences. It is really so powerful to feel like that one story then connects with thousands and millions of others. And it's just, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to connect on that really deep level with people you've never even met a hundred percent your post i always remember seeing it i always remember where i was when i saw it i had never seen anybody any physician especially a physician in the position that you were in post about bipolar disorder i was in the space i was in the doctor mental health space i had never seen it done and so once you did it it was like it was proof it was the word i used i think when we met at the apa was it, it, it showed representation it's you don't know you can do something until you see somebody that is experiencing what you're experiencing do it and people saw that and they were like wait a minute if she could do it i could do it i could i could become a physician i can i could become the surgeon general of california i could do anything with bipolar disorder so i i all the props to you that was one of the coolest things i've ever seen on social thanks jenny i really appreciate that of course. We're kindred spirits in this life, um, trying to do the stigma reduction work that we are together. Absolutely. So, you know, you've alluded to this a little bit in this conversation already, and it was the subject of your TEDx talk, which was extremely powerful around fixing a broken medical system, right? Mm -hmm. And specifically the training part of that medical system. There's so many aspects to think through about this. But if you could help us understand really what it looks like for uh, the meta-analyses will show one in three to one in four medical students will have clinical symptoms consistent with depression, and then only one in six of them will actually end up seeking formal treatment. Um, and you're saying, you know, in your TEDx talk, you use these very powerful and evocative phrases, we are generating more sufferers of mental illness than we are healers. And that mm -hmm. training is actually an occupational hazard, which is both unethical and unsafe. And you talk about the different layers of toxicity that exist. So can you tell us where you think we need to go with it? I'll speak from most residents' experiences, so I don't kind of focus on my own, because uh, we're all in this same system. And the way the system is set up is that currently, today, you know, we're talking on August 2023, it is completely legal and 
accepted for resident doctors to work up to 28 hours in a ship. 28 hours. And one of the statistics that I cite in the TED Talk is that research shows that if you've been awake for 24 hours or more, uh, you have physiological changes in your body that actually mimic the effects of alcohol intoxication. Very similar physiological changes that occur in your body, decreased reaction time, decreased ability to focus. And um, if you're awake for more than 24 hours, it's about the equivalent of having a blood alcohol content of 0.1, which is above the legal limit to drive. 0.08 is, thinking most states, is a legal limit to drive. Uh, so we are essentially asking resident doctors to operate on or treat a person when their physiological reactions in their body are such that they wouldn't be able to legally operate a vehicle because of their level of essentially intoxication. When you've been awake for that long, your your brain, your body, you can't be at your best, not even close to your best. So we're when I say we, I mean really the ACGME, you know, which is the people that credit resident programs in this country. They do the accreditation process. They're the ones that really make the rules. You know, that those are currently the rules. It's still completely legal, completely accepted to do 24, 25, 28 hour shifts. That's number one. I mean, find another career in which human lives are at risk that allows that. I would be shocked. I use the example in my TED talk about Imagine you were about to get on a flight to Hawaii and the doctor turned to you and said, I haven't slept in 23 hours. Would you get on that flight? I mean, no way would I ever step foot on that flight. So there's an archaic, you know, hour restriction and culture that um, forces resident doctors to work incredibly long hours. That's number one. You could imagine the effects that have on people's mental health. And also the effects it has on patient care, quite frankly. Then there's a culture that exists within medicine where it can be toxic. You know, medicine is a very much a hierarchy. Medical student, you know, fourth year medical student, sub-I, intern, which is first year resident, junior resident, senior resident, chief resident, fellow, attending. You know, even after that, there's more layers that, you know, continue to build and there's a culture in medicine, not for everybody, because there are physicians that are kind, respectful to all their colleagues, but there is a culture that can exist in residency of hazing, of disrespect. If you come into to medical training with a predisposition for a, a mental health condition, odds are medical training is going to make Rip it come it to its surface. Totally. And if you don't come in with a predisposition to a mental health condition, you still probably could end up getting a mental health condition through just the brute hours and the toxic culture. So those are some of the major problems. There's many. And if you're interested in this type of topic, definitely check out my TED Talk because I go into the different issues that exist and some potential solutions that exist as well. You know, the stats you said are absolutely right. About one in four medical students will experience depression throughout their training. And same goes for residency. At one in nine trainees, medical students are residents, will experience suicide ideation in their training or thoughts of, of ending their lives. That's incredibly scary numbers. And for me to get on stage and talk about it was something I'm really proud about because I was able to like just take the mask off and just be like, this is what's actually going on out there right now. Let's talk about it. Yeah. It is striking that in 2023... We are not only allowing, but blessing these shifts that we know are equivalent to people being drunk on their feet, taking care of patients, taking care of our parents, our sisters, our, you know, daughters and sons. And somehow, you know, the powers that be that have transpired to bring us to this point, which include a cocaine adult attending by the name of Halstead at Johns Hopkins and all of the really complicated financial interests that persist to this day to maintain the system the way it is, it's just absolutely striking because the truth is that a lot of people outside of medicine don't know that this is how it stands today, right? And we speak to people who are in other professions, just like you talk about in your TED Talk, you know, pilots, lawyers, any profession where you're really dealing with 
the intricacies of human life. You just can't imagine any other context in which this could be legal. Right. I can't imagine that this will continue to be. Truthfully, I thought we would see changes by now, real objective changes. I'm not talking about wellness modules. I'm talking about real objective changes. But we really don't have those yet. Just like, you know, if you're listening to this and you're very interested in the history, you know, look up Libby Sion and look up, you know, what happened in in New York and just like 10 second synopsis. Essentially, a young woman died uh, in the New York emergency room in large part due to a, a medical error that was made by an overworked resident physician. And that essentially established the work hour restrictions of 80 hours a week that we have today. You know, unfortunately, I think it will take someone getting seriously hurt or or killed in order for things to change, whether that's a patient or that's a resident or you know what have you. If we still have 28-hour shifts in 10 years in medical training, there was something's very much wrong here. Right. And beyond that, to be fair, right? I mean, I think we need to obviously reform the whole system, but attendings work those same hours, you know, in certain systems as well. It's <laughs> highly unsafe and toxic. Yeah. Um, and I'm with you. Whatever we can do to join forces on this, I think it's one of those low-hanging fruits. And it's easier to fix in a lot of ways than the toxicity of the culture and the hierarchy and the, mm-hmm. kind of the legal factors that surround the underpinnings of mental illness for trainees mm-hmm. and physicians. Yep. Agreed. So... Yeah. Putting that, you know, on one burner for a second, I'm curious to know how has stigma affected you in your journey? At first, stigma prevented me from seeking help. That would have been really, it would have been really nice to to reach out to a therapist and talk to a therapist when I was in college going through it. It would have been really nice. You know, I think part of it is, is being a guy, you know, there's a, in men's culture, there's, uh, although it's gotten so much better. There's uh, totally a stigma against men, you know, going to a therapist, therapist, or going to a psychiatrist, talking about their mental health in general. You know, I, I can't really recall any conversations about mental health that I had with my guy friends in high school or college. Maybe that was a circle I was in. I'm not quite sure, but it wasn't really talked about. And uh, even when I realized, like, yeah, this is probably anxiety, the thought never even really crossed my mind of, like, I should go get this looked at. I should go, like, talk to somebody whose job it is to help people who are struggling with this because the stigma just prevented me from even going there. And as I, you know, grew up, I saw some of the worst case scenarios that can occur with mental illness. I had a friend that passed away from suicide when I was in college. I didn't see that happen, but I I was there, you know, in the aftermath of it. And um, oh, thank you. Thank you. That really just uh, was like a smashing a hammer in glass. It was just like total wake up call that this is the kind of stuff that can happen. It's not just like, you know, the person gets really sad and isolates for a little while. Like people are dying out here at an alarming, alarming rate. And it took some things like that for me to realize this is worth, you know, talking about, not just for myself, but for other people, like let's have these conversations. And now I'm such a proponent. I'm on this side of the spectrum now of like, let's talk about everything because you almost have to push the, the boundaries and the barriers in order to get the culture, you know, shifted. I'd like to think that I've had a very small effect on the shift in the culture of, at least in the medical field, talking about mental health, but hopefully in the, you know, general public and especially I think in male culture and, and mental health. I hope I've pushed the culture like a millimeter in the direction of like, let's just talk about how we feel and let's not be afraid to go seek help. And so now I'm a huge proponent of crushing stigma and I'm posting on social media all the time about my own experience in mental health and my experience studying mental health, treating mental health and experiencing mental health. 
Absolutely. And just to underline one really important set of points around, you know, male mental health and how we have to, even when kids are growing up, normalize a full access to the entire emotional range for both boys and girls and folks who are gender diverse. Because as you know, right, men are diagnosed with depression, for example, at half the rate that women are. And part of that is that they are socialized to have access to this very restricted emotional range and often show up with symptoms like irritability or anger mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than sadness. You know, the model that we have, the DSM-5 list of criteria that we have for major depression often is misaligned with the way in which men express depressive symptoms. And then yet... Men are dying by suicide at 4x the rate that women are. And there's a lot wrapped up into that. It's very complicated. But certainly one aspect is opening up this full emotional range and allowing for men to feel and talk about and feel entitled to emotions. I couldn't agree more. And I think that the younger culture is really moving in that direction, not just for men, but in general. I have three nieces and they're at all different ages, but I see them the way my two-year-old niece will say, I'm angry. And it's like, I didn't even know what that really meant or to be like, I'm sad until I was like much older, until I could recognize my emotions. So they're, you know, with movies like Inside Out and with celebrities like Selena Gomez and Michael Phelps, and I can go on and on with people talking about it now. Like that younger culture is uh, big time. And they're so like going to therapy, from what I understand, talking to my niece, who is now about to be in middle school, going to therapy is like cool in their uh, generation. Can you imagine how amazing that is? That is amazing. That really, truly is amazing. It's funny. I'm thinking about my own two-year-old. His name is Rumi. And recently, we've been moving him around a lot. So we went nomadic as a family. And he's had access to all kinds of new emotions. Like, I'm scared. I am happy. I'm sad. <laughs> and he has all of these big feelings. And, and it's really remarkable and wonderful for him to be able to talk to us about them. Right? And uh -huh. um, yeah. And it's a striking difference from, for instance, my husband, I would say he learned how to talk, speak about his emotions, you know, as an adult. And he is so struck by the change in just one generation, just within our family in this. I'm hopeful. I'm really hopeful. In the younger generation, seeing Gen Z and whatever the new generation is called, they're embracing mental health to the fullest. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so this next question is a fun one, and I'm interested to know where you're going to go with it. What's a mental health myth that you'd like to bust for us? What immediately comes to mind is that stimulants are, for people with ADHD, are addictive and shouldn't be used. Stimulants are so stigmatized in the media. And the reality is, for people that have ADHD, studies have consistently shown year after year after year, that stimulant medication for someone that is old enough it can be an incredible medication at relieving the symptoms of ADHD. Incredible. I think from my memory, I'll have to check this, but I think with one stimulant medication, 70% of patients improve in their symptoms of ADHD. And if that first stimulant medication doesn't work and they try a second stimulant medication between the two of them, 80% of patients improve with their symptoms of ADHD. That number that doesn't exist in mental health, you know, antidepressants aren't even close to that kind of remission or improvement in, in symptoms, not even close. And I wish there was a little bit less of a stigma towards stimulant medication because in the right person, they can be so effective. And they're not perfect, just like any other mental health medications. Our medications have side effects. There's things to be aware of. There's contraindications for people to use them, but they can be so effective. So that's number one. I actually did a video about this where I had my mom come in and as part of the video say like, I will never give my kid a stimulant for me to kind of be like, well, hold on, let me dispel that. And I basically talked about how um, everything I just told you there. That's myth number one. 
And then I'd say myth number two is that what you're going through, nobody else can understand or nobody else has experienced what I've experienced. No one else is feeling like this. And the reality is so many people struggle in so many different ways, but you know, about one in four people will struggle with depression at some point in their life. And maybe one in five, I don't want to get slammed in the comments because someone checks the World Health Organization website and says, it was actually one in five. But let's say somewhere between 20 and 25% at some point in their life. And you know, depression is a range like we talked about, but feeling isolated, feeling like you can't sleep, staying up all night and staring at the ceiling, wondering why you have ruminating thoughts. These are things that people experience and you're not the only one going through it. And it can feel like that. And that's sometimes mental health. That's some of the symptoms of mental health is feeling isolated, feeling like you're the only one that's going through it. But it's not true. It's not true. And there are people that have felt just the way that you feel. And that's the beauty of social media is once you find out that someone else is going through the same thing you're going through, and it doesn't have to be the same thing, the same exact situation. But wait a minute, somebody else is staying awake at night and staring at the ceiling and unable to get their thoughts out of their mind. And it makes you feel less alone. And when you feel less alone, you feel like, well, they're having it and maybe they're getting better. I can get better too. You know, I love both of those. As a pediatrician, I've seen that magic that a stimulant or the right ADHD medication with the right titration and oversight what that can do to a young kid and the whole family and how that can really turn around their trajectory. And the second one, I mean, I think that's just so beautifully put because that is the pernicious, insidious, treacherous part of having a mental illness is it makes you feel like you're an end of one and no (laughs) one could possibly love you if they truly knew what you were going through or how you were feeling or much much less understand your experience, right? And to know that actually literally millions of people throughout the world are experiencing potentially the exact same feeling at the exact same time and that there is a recognizable way of constructing, you know, that diagnostic understanding of, of what it is that'll make you feel better from that point onwards. Yeah, and, sure. and that's really where it becomes so powerful to know that you're in a tribe of millions of other humans who have been successfully treated in the same exact boat that you're finding yourself in. Totally. Every mental health condition has a treatment. I'm not aware of any mental health condition that we just say, no, good luck. You know, we can't really help you. Of course, there's ones that are more difficult to treat than others, without a doubt. But there is a treatment option out there that can help you feel better in what Ever you are going through in the mental health world. And if there's something that we don't have a treatment for yet, let me know because I, I would love to study that. Yeah, it's coming, right? There may not be a perfect medication for you right now, but mental health is also moving at a rapid rate. And we're having newer and newer treatments that are coming out that are amazing, amazing. I'm studying TMS right now, transmagnetic stimulation for depression and a couple other mental health conditions. We're looking at a whole new branch of medications with, you know, psilocybin for for PTSD. We're looking at ketamine. The future is so bright. And whatever you're going through right now, if you haven't found the right treatment, there's something out there that's there or that's coming that's going to help you out. Thinking about what it takes, especially as a resident, to stay well day to day, what are your kind of top strategies for managing your anxiety and depression as you go through your life? I've lived a life full of stressors as anybody else has, and I've struggled with anxiety as a lot of other people have, and I've kind of found what works for me. There's a concept called the life force that's taught by a physician named Dr. Stutz. I did a documentary on him on on Netflix. Um, Jonah Hill, I think, was uh, the person who... I think there's some controversy about Jonah Hill right now, but Uh, Regardless, Dr. Stutz is the psychiatrist I'm talking about, and he created a concept. uh, Like you said, you saw it. It's called the life force. It's a triangle. And I I actually like to teach this to patients because it's really cool. At the bottom of the triangle is um, your relationship to your body. And that's what I want to focus on here is um, there are really three things that I 
are sort of my non-negotiables. And that's number one is sleep. Consistent quality sleep, i.e. seven to nine hours. It's different for everybody. Some people, they can get by with less. Consistent quality sleep over a long period of time is one of the best preventative treatments that we have to keep yourself in the best mental state. I believe it's like uh, up there with some of the best mental health treatments we have. If you can, and I know it's not easy, especially if part of the symptoms you're experiencing are insomnia, you know, difficulty sleeping. But if you can get seven to nine hours of sleep consistently, going to sleep around the same time, waking up around the same time, that is huge for your mental health. So that's what I check myself on all the time. Am I getting the proper sleep? If I, if I go a couple of nights in a row, six, six, five, five, four and a half hours of sleep, it starts to catch up to me. In that same bottom row is nutrition. Uh, I'm pretty good about eating good food, but also making sure I'm eating at consistent times and making sure I'm eating a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner, and that those options are high in stuff that keeps me going. I don't need a hamburger at three different meals. I'm really able to eat a balanced fruit, veggies sort of diet. And in a good way, because my wife is a killer chef, uh, not really chef, but I will call her a cook. She makes incredible meals and I've been helping out too. So um, solid sleep, solid food, and then exercise. There's recently just a study came out about the effects of burst exercises. I don't know if you saw this. It came out like last week about the reduction in uh, cancer risk. It was like two to three minutes of like burst exercise, high intensity, just, you know, two to three minutes of running up the stairs at work, stuff like that has been shown to reduce uh, cancer risk over a prolonged period of time. So exercising, and that doesn't need to be a 60-minute workout every day. For me, I play soccer twice a week. I get on the Peloton for 15 minutes a day if I can. Sometimes I do yoga for eight minutes, whatever it is. So for me, that sort of makes the base of the pyramid. And uh, that's what I make sure is my non-negotiables every day. And like I said, even if it's a a few minutes of exercise, I I check that box and that keeps me kind of stable. That's awesome. And I love that way of thinking about it. We're going to put up that triangle for everyone to to know exactly what you're talking about there. I think we have time probably for one or two more questions. So I'm going to lob this one at you and see how you go. How do you see your journey? And it can be your mental health journey or your journey in general as having molded your unique superpowers? Well, that's a great question. I think I've really embraced vulnerability which would have shocked me when I was in high school because I was definitely not a vulnerable person, nor was I in college. I, I read a book. At this point, the book's almost cliche to mention because it's become such a household name, but The Power of Vulnerability by Brene Brown. I read that book in college, and that really changed the way that I viewed vulnerability. I used to view vulnerability as a weakness, and now I view it as one of the biggest strengths you could possibly have. When you are vulnerable, you empower other people. You empower yourself. It's one of the strongest things you can do in life is to be vulnerable with yourself and vulnerable with your patients, vulnerable with your loved ones, with anybody in your life. And I've embraced vulnerability on social media big time and I talk about my own, you know, things I've gone through. I ended up having a, a melanoma scare two years ago, not even two years ago. I had a melanoma in situ on my head uh, right there. That's what that little scar is from. And I just talked openly about the experience of like finding out I had skin cancer at, you know, 29 years old. And that allowed other people to look into their own, you know, derm conditions and started going to the dermatologist and get skin checks and people messaging me all the time. Just being vulnerable and telling people what's actually going on has been like one of the grounding kind of principles that I've lived by over the last five years or so. And I see myself continuing to do that. You know, no matter where I'm at in the future, I I plan to always be vulnerable because I view that as one of the biggest strengths that I have. What a true gift for you to have found that strength and to tap into it in the ways that you do today. Thank you. Thank you. So one final question. What are your hopes as you look forward for yourself, but also for us collectively in the future? That's a great question. I would like to just see a world where... Talking about mental health is no big deal. 
I would like to see a world where if I would put that post up about a pill in my mouth, I would like to see a world where people are like, okay, who cares? Like that would have been the best, you know, and maybe that's 40 years out of line. Imagine that I had a pill for high blood pressure on my mouth. And I said, I'm Dr. Jake and I take medication for high blood pressure. People would be like, all right, cool. Like, so do so everybody. It's not a big deal. That's where I hope the world goes so that talking about mental health is no big deal at all. It's totally normalized. Just like high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, and a million of other things out there in, in medicine. It's just normal. And going to a therapist is no different than going to your primary care doctor, going to a psychiatrist isn't a big deal. It's something that anybody has access to. This is in my you know dream world 10, 20 years away. It, everyone has access to it. It's affordable and it's normalized. And it's it's almost cool to, to go out and reach out, feel better about yourself and improve your mental health. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much, Jake, for being here for spreading the light with just everything that you put out into the world. We are so lucky to have you. And thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Davika. I'm truly honored. It was a blast.